Hello, I am Maimouna Touma, co-founder of Gribouilly, a French social venture empowering domestic workers. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome the Imam Dr. Omar Suleiman for the fireside chat uh, called Renewing the Civil Rights Movements Now. This is a conversation that we selected before the death of George Floyd and Richard Brooks and the global movements that were triggered by, the, by this uh, drum and um, it's echoing in many countries, in Brazil or in France. And so it's a very interesting topic to have today. And it's a pleasure to have so the Imam Dr. Omar Suleiman. He is a world-renowned scholar and theologically driven activist for human rights. He is the founder and president of the Yakin Institute for Islamic Research and a professor of Islamic studies at Southern Methodist University. He is also the resident scholar of the Valley Ranch Islamic Center and co-chair emeritus of Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square, a multi-faith coalition of clergy for peace and justice. He frequently writes for CNN, USA Today, The Guardian, The Huffington Post, The Dallas Morning News. His career started in his hometown of New Orleans where he served as the Imam of the Jefferson Muslim Association in New Orleans for six years and directed the Muslim for Humanity Hurricane Katrina relief effort. He was in his time that he was noted on the national level as being a strong advocate of community service, interface dialogue and social justice. Most recently, he was recognized by CNN as one of the 25 most influential Muslims in America and including amongst the Frederick Douglass, 200 most influential Americans whose modern day work embody the legacy of the great abolitionist. So thank you very much, Imam, for being uh, with us today at this fireside chat. Um, this is a very specific time that we are living uh, in all the world. And we have seen that in the past weeks, um, we had an increase of the awareness about racism in the US and elsewhere. And more and more, we can see that many are not focusing on the white supremacy, but directly on the state, uh, wondering why the society is accepting this situation and this intensity of violence. Do you understand this shift of the guilt that we now uh, really embodied in the state yes so you know just to give you some some context as to where i'm sitting right now uh 20 minutes south of me is where botham john uh, a young black man was sitting in his uh, apartment watching uh football eating ice cream when officer amber Geiger, amber geiger walked into his apartment and shot him dead claiming that she thought it was her apartment 20 minutes uh to my west is where Tatiana Jefferson was also murdered in her home by an officer after a neighbor called the police uh, saying that her front door was open with only her screen door there, uh, which she had done as she was playing video games with her nephew so that she could get fresh air into the home and an officer shot her through her, bed through her bedroom uh, window dead uh, in front of her nephew. Uh, and of course, 25 minutes uh, in downtown Dallas is where uh, a few years ago, uh, a mass protest took place in the wake of the assassination, the police assassinations of Alton, uh, Alton Sterling and, uh, and Philando Castile, uh, July 5th and July 6th. And then July 7th, we had a massive protest in downtown Dallas. Afterwards, uh, a man shot dead five police officers in Dallas. And so Dallas became the epicenter once, once again uh, so when it comes to uh, police violence and when it comes to what we're witnessing, particularly in the United States, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, where Hurricane Katrina hit and where many uh, scholars say the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement could have really begun in New Orleans because of what happened in the disproportionate response and the willing sacrifice of uh, thousands of black citizens in New Orleans uh, for the state and by the state. And here I am now in Dallas, where uh, the Urban Institute says Dallas has the worst racialized poverty in America, in the United States of America. And we have, uh, you know, some of the more prominent police killings that have taken place here. And so, indeed, these are unique times. 
It's a transformant. It's a trans transformational moment, potentially transformational moments, a reconstruction not just of the United States uh, potentially, but also shifting the dynamics of the world in how anti-blackness and more specifically the oppression and persecution of minorities, uh, it, or more generally the oppression and persecution of minorities around the world uh, takes place. And so uh, I am uh, optimistic that. Uh, through what we are witnessing now, uh, we, we may witness a shift um, in the dynamics of this conversation, which hopefully uh, will, will allow us to experience some very needed, uncomfortable growth. How can we finally think about a transformation of the state itself through its institutions? Um, we, we talk about uh, the police department, um, but the social injustice is not only in this place. We know that. Yes. So what do you think about um, the, the transformation that the state needs to impulse to change the situation? And so, you know, we're witnessing, uh, you know, the interconnectedness of so many different issues. And so speaking from an American context, um, you know, the police department, as it functions in the United States, uh, is directly tied to how our military, the United States military, functions abroad. The uh, the disregard for human life, the excesses that are often forgiven in the name of security, collateral damage, the training of U.S. police uh, forces uh, that Amnesty recently published uh, with uh, Israeli. Uh, with, with Israeli occupational forces, right? So you're learning how to occupy the streets of, of, of your own nation. Um, and in fact, that move of the knee on the neck, right? According to the report from Amnesty is one that's, that's a learned one. And so there's a connection between how the United States uh, functions with its, through its police department here in our inner, street, in our inner cities and how our military functions abroad and there is a direct link with America's internationalism, uh, with how the world order functions and how, um, you know, what sort of is considered the standard of, of ethics. And a lot of times diplomacy allows you to mask uh, many detestable practices. Uh, we live in a time, and I say this as an American, where our diplomacy has been laid bare. Uh, what is detestable is is laid bare. Uh, we can no longer pretend to be the moral standard of the world, uh, both in peace and in war, in treaties, or in, uh, in in how we we deal with people at the border and migration ethics. We can no longer masquerade as such. It's been laid bare, and in that is an opportunity for us to really rethink. Uh, you know, what does internationalism, healthy international cooperation, look like? What does it look like to uh, function in a world now where states cannot buy the silence of other states uh, after committing heinous murders of, of, of journalists abroad or, of, uh, or bombing neighboring nations or uh, carrying out ethnic cleansing and genocide uh, like we see with the Rohingya and we see with the Uyghurs? What does it look like to actually really uh, reshape this all together? And I think that before you can get to a place of accountability, you have to have transparency. And one of the things that's happening right now is that it's not that more brutality is taking place. And perhaps that is the case. I mean, statistically speaking, there are more police killings now in the United States than before. Uh, every year there's an upward climb. And so, so it is happening more. But uh, that brutality is being filmed and the world is seeing it. And so individual citizens are then able to witness the murder of innocent people on their screens and that can either paralyze them to say that we are buried by this current uh by, by this current function of the world that allows for governments to act in this way or we can be activated to work in our individual locations to work with our own uh, uh pools and communities of activists and advocates and committed people uh, to change the way that our own governments play into uh, this this global dy dynamic that we have right now, where you know innocent life can be taken with such impunity, 
this last century, the you know the era of World War II, what we witnessed in this last century, um, you know, we're really seeing the effect of what weapons of mass destruction, and I'm not talking about the ones that Saddam Hussein supposedly had, I'm talking about weapons of mass destruction, uh, which really speaks to the arsenals of, of, of militaries around the world. We're seeing the impact of how we have been able to reduce hum human beings, human dignity, and turn it into hashtags and statistics. And so a bomb fell here, one terrorist was killed, 130 people were killed in a wedding. Uh, the hashtags, the multiple innocent black men that are murdered in the United States and others, by the way, uh, by the police department here. But you know what? Well, it, it's, it's a necessary evil that we have to cope with. And so we're seeing the reduction of human dignity that directly correlates with the inflation of state unchecked power. We, we have um, a lot of advocacy um, to have more transparency, as you said, and including on, on the money that is just um, spent on, on this mil militarization of the police and of the armies. Um, we, we think right now that this money should not be uh, for weapons, but uh, for social justice. What do you think is a priority right now for the U.S. Um, to, to have a better future for everybody, white and non-white? Uh, what is the most important um, maybe investment that uh, should be done right now? Well, the investment should be in communities. <clears throat> and that's the thing. I think that the, divest, the call for divestment um, that is happening right now is to divest from the police and to invest in the communities that are over-policed. The reason why those communities are over-policed is because they've been decimated by white supremacy. The reason why the over-policing leads to the co consistent uh, rising casualty counts and, and mass incarceration is because of white supremacy. And so you have to deal with it from both ends. Uh, you know, these the, the African-American community has never uh, you know, uh, been able to escape the systems that have uh, con continued to decimate that community here in the United States. And so, you know, all, you can trace it all the way from slavery to Jim Crow to redlining here in the United States and what that has translated to. And so you have uh, over-policing, the police act with excessive force. You have uh, low education. Uh, high rates of crime that directly correlate to poverty. And people will say, well, you know, they'll try to assign a criminal identity. And so, like I say, domestic playbook, global playbook. The global playbook that Muslims are more dangerous uh, because look at the Middle East and escaping, escaping the consequences of war and decimation. And so you only deal with the, with, with the end cause. And in the, in the process of that, assign a terrorist identity. Likewise, with uh, Mexicans south of the U.S. border, the identity that's been assigned to them. Likewise, with African Americans inside our inner cities, the criminal identity, the violent identity that's been assigned to suggest that there's an inherent, an inherent uh, uh, dispensation towards violence, which is racism, right? That is in and of itself racism. Every group of people uh, uh, have... Uh, you know, proportional rates of murder within the proximity of themselves. And so even the usage, for example, of black on black crime is, is, is a racist stereotype. Why? No one says white on white crime. If you're white, you're more likely to be killed by someone who's white. But it's to say that there is an identity of violence similar to Islamic terrorists to suggest that terrorism is unique to Islam and Muslims, which is statistically false. And so we have to deal with the root causes of, uh, ask ourselves, how did we get here? Invest in communities, uh, build education instead of prisons. When we say divest from the police, the militarization of the police, if you look at any city budget, major city budget in the United States, there is such a heavy uh, uh, you know, uh, amount, percentage of, of the city's budget that goes towards policing. And there are simple things that, you know, if the excuse is that there's crime, there are simple things that, by the way, can be done in communities, very practical things, specific things, not abstract, you know, imaginations, very specific things that can be done within communities that reduce the so-called need of policing, 
when we say that when someone makes an emergency phone call, uh, no one should lose their emergency phone call. No one should lose their 911 phone call. But who answers the phone and who gets sent out? Who gets dispatched? And so if you have a, a young black man who's experiencing uh, schizophrenia and a cop comes and with, you know answers that 911 call instead of a mental health team, he's not dangerous, he's not harming anyone, but within minutes he's shot dead in the street. That's the problem, right? So we're talking about increasing investment in the community, increasing safety. And the way that this ties to the global, once again, you know, Malcolm X uh, at Hajj Medica Shabazz had a very powerful statement. He said that they clip the bird's wing and then blame it for not flying as high as them. You cannot decimate communities around the world or within your cities and then over criminalize them and then enforce criminal enforcement against them and claim that this is a necessary evil. You have to deal with the root evil that continues to leave countries and communities without fair and equal opportunities that, uh, that, that, would, that would allow those communities and those countries to flourish and to grow. And that, that, that has to be solved uh, with, with both uh, divesting from uh, practices of over-militarization and investing in communities and in countries and in education and in prosperity that gives people a chance to properly flourish and to prosper. We, we see a lot of um, very hopeful initiatives in communities and out of the communities. Um, very often the issue is like the, the scaling of their impact um, because they face this situation of uh, a state of violence, as we said. And it seems that there is a need today to have broader coalitions to have uh, maybe a more efficient advocacy and maybe also a more effective um, roadmap on the field. Um, what are your ideas? What are you doing right now in Dallas? As you said, this is a, a place where we can see a lot of social injustice today. So what could be your advice maybe to all those leaders of small communities or small initiatives to, to make it bigger and impactful? So um, I'm a Muslim and I, and I act from a place of, of faith and spirituality. My grounding is in Islam. And um, I believe that Islam is a potent liberation theology. Um, and one of the ways in, in which it, it activates me, and I'm, and I'm going to say this to sort of explain where my framework comes from, uh, is that you know one of the, the most powerful examples of coalition building actually comes from the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was called Hilf al-Fudul. Hilf al-Fudul meant the League of Justice. And uh, it was the way that it formulated was that there was a man who was unjustly taken advantage of, but that didn't have the tribal protection that other tribes had in, in a feudal system. And uh, he complained about the mistreatment and he shamed the Arabs. Uh, this was before the Prophet Muhammad had declared prophethood, had become a prophet. Uh, he shamed the Arabs for claiming to be a people of nobility yet not living up to those ethics because people of no tribe could be taken advantage of and have their rights consumed in such a way. And so uh, he, as, as he shamed them, the story of that one man, and that's actually the power of one story. We're seeing it with, with, uh, with, with George Floyd right now. The story of one man, when captured properly, can shift an entire society. And so tribes came together, a few tribes came together, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was instrumental in the formulating of that pact to say that we will defend every person's rights and not allow them to be taken advantage of, no matter what tribe they belong to, no matter what background they have, no matter where they come from. And he and he said that after uh, Islam had come, he said that uh, if I was to be called to this pact again, it is still in effect. And if I was to be called to it again, I would do it again, that, it's a, that it is a powerful way of human solidarity. So what do I take from that in my, you know, 21st century uh, model? I believe that political polarization actually stops us, stops us from having effective coalition building. What that means is that what we see now that's happening in the political space is that you have very broad platforms. And sometimes those platforms contain issues that not everyone can, can gather around or, or a significant group of people can't gather around. And so what it does is it polarizes and alienates uh, a large group of potential effective partners in noble causes. 
Uh, and so as the platform grows, the group of people that are willing to adopt that large platform uh, shrinks. And so people people's efforts are not as profound and powerful. What I advocate for are taking issues, uh, being very specific with the issues, and then forming the broadest coalitions possible around those issues. And the example that I give is uh, at the border here at the, in the United States, um, there are many people that are not as activated towards issues that I care about. And in fact, could be opponents of mine on certain issues. But you know what? Right now, we need to get kids out of cages. We need to unite families. We need to stop the oppression that's happening at the border of the United States. Are you willing to join hands with me in that? That does not mean that I carry your entire political uh, baggage, and nor do you carry my entire political uh, principles. And so I think that it's important for us to uh, take issues that are of human concern, human concern, and, uh, and take specific issues and then build broad coalitions around those issues. And then when it comes to the issues that we cannot deal with, with one another with, or, or there are certain things where there are going to be inevitable differences, the way that we build human solidarity around issues of mutual concern will allow us to navigate those divisions uh, 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 you know, in, in a more civil way. So often civil discourse, the term civil discourse and reconciliation are used to shut down justice movements. Uh, my, my view on that is that justice movements can actually give, give uh, weight to civil discourse so long as people learn to work together on issues of mutual concern. Uh, so I think we need to uh, hone in on issues of mutual concern and uh, that would stop some of the polarization that makes us ineffective in our coalition building and that's a tall order. Uh, not 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 everyone agrees with me in that philosophy. So I'm just I'm stating very simply that this is my organizing philosophy. That if we're going to have a task force on poverty, let's have a task force on poverty. If we're going to work on police brutality, let's work on police brutality. If we're going to work on anti-war, uh, the most religious person and the most secular person who don't agree on many things, but they agree that we're over militarized and that our foreign policy is unprincipled and needs to change. Uh, need to work together on that anti-war movement uh, and, 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 and gather around the table for the sake of the cause. Uh, so I think that that's something that um, I hope is an organizing philosophy that more people will, uh, will experiment with. Coming to this, um, to this framework that you have in your activism, um, I suppose that you, you faced also like this situation where you you want people from the communities, people who are deprived to engage uh, for change, uh, which is often difficult because you, you may lose your sense of citizenship when we remove your dignity. Um, so do you have some tips maybe um, to engage more and more people? We see that many people who, who, who have been walking in the street um, during the past uh, weeks never participated to any initiatives. Uh, it was the first time for them. So how can we get more and more people involved for change today? Um, there's a wonderful book that I'd recommend that um, that people read, uh, which is called Stride Toward Freedom by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote it in his 20s, actually, after the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and I think that one of the powerful things that Dr. King uh, saw was that you have to make people too uncomfortable uh, with the status quo. And so what he meant by that was that, you know, he saw that many people were sympathetic to the cause, but they were comfortable in merely sitting with their sympathy at home and not doing anything about it. And uh, what he, powerful, what, what he said in, in such a powerful way was that, um, you know, they needed to see, uh, particularly when he was talking about white people that were sympathetic to the black cause, that, that they would be activated once they saw, uh, you know, the, the images of violence that black people were encountering on a regular basis. And hence Selma, the power of Selma, right, where the images of Selma were broadcast. And uh, this was a way, by the way, that Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were, were complementary, uh, particularly in the last year of Malcolm's life, 
Uh, Malcolm uh, knew that uh, America's foreign policy, um, you know, rested on this idea of America's superior ethics. And when he was gathering the international community <laughs> to uh, prosecute, to put the United States on trial for its treatment of, uh, of black people in America, uh, that was a threat to America's foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was engaging in what would become the imagery that the Malcolms of the world could then carry to the international communities to say, look, this is what's really happening. And, uh, and I think that's what made uh, their coming together, by the way, such a, such a great threat, um, you know, uh, towards the end of Malcolm's life where he was assassinated in 65 and then uh, Dr. King shortly after in 1968. Um, but they could not, you know, it, it, was, it was unaffordable <laughs> uh, to the power structure that those two would start to work together. But that, that's where it became complementary, right? And so the way that I see that is external pressure, um, you know, internal pressure, um, you know, uh, Dr. King uh, tried to activate the broader American society. Um, you know, Malcolm X uh, believed in fostering a strong black identity, sort of a community take its own narrative in its hand first and not, not rest on the sympathies of anybody else. Uh, the international community versus the domestic community, I think all of these philosophies then become complementary in that regard. The point is, is that you have to disrupt people's status quo. And so the oppressed cannot become depressed and just think that I have nothing to do with my situation and that the odds are too overwhelming for me to be able to overcome them. And those that claim to be allies, but that comfortably rest on the sidelines and say that the methods are uncomfortable or, you know, yeah, this is bad, but I'm not really gonna, they have to be rocked out of their status quo um, until things, uh, until things change. And so I think that's how you start to activate uh, numerous people uh, to, to really start to, to demand change and make change uh, with whatever is available to them. We, we, we see that um, um, there are people engaging and some people who are still having some fears, fears about black people, about migrants and, and more. Um, Often I like to, to, to think that they don't really, they are not really afraid of the people, but they're afraid of their own job insecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the fact that uh, they are not able to describe their, their, what is their identity and, and, and other things like that. Um, how can we make them engage? How can we make them understand that there is no fear uh, and, and make them some allies in, in this change as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I think, um, look, you know, racism, you know, it, it preys on insecurity. People are insecure with themselves. And, uh, you know, they often escape. And that's why uh, state actors can often escape their own caused economic woes in their nations by scapegoating uh, another group of people and usually choosing a foreign group of people, whether they're in, actual, in actuality foreign or they appear to be foreign or they've been otherized enough to make them the scapegoat to redirect people's attention from state failure. Um, you know, it's important for us to be able to distinguish um, you know, what is just the, you know, the, the other rising of people and the way that the state takes advantage of people as a whole through that other rising. What I mean by that is that white supremacy, for example, is detrimental, not just to non-whites. It's detrimental to poor white working class people who have been told that this is the reason why you're economically struggling. This is the reason why you don't have access to these things. And then elect the people that will actually implement policies that will that will put them in further detriment and harm right so you elect uh you know a, you you elect donald trump you know a billionaire uh to to solve your economic woes when has he ever cared about the poor right when has he ever what's he going to do but but by by distracting using the tools of racism uh people will put into power those that will uh that will further their detriment 
Um, and so I think that what's important for us is to push back on nationalism and fascism and, and, and you know, push back on those overwhelming ideologies and uh, help fight facts, uh, help fight fear with facts, right? Um, you know, so when it comes to migrants and immigrants, and immigrants are not, and I'm talking about from an American context, and, you know, it's important that immigrants are not more dangerous. They're, they're, no, there's most of them are hardworking people that are that are actually putting into the economy not taking away from the economy why is it that there is such such fear that's that's told about them and so uh you know in the united states to understand the structure the department of homeland security uh was created um in in an islamophobic climate and ice as an agency was created as a subsidiary of the department of homeland security and ICE uh, wreaks terror on immigrant communities. I mean, you imagine the, the the climate when immigrant parents will drop off their kids at school, and as soon as they wave bye to their kids, the kids are still taken away from the schools and put into these cells. And uh, uh, for profit, right? For profit immigration centers, uh, for profit cells, and the parents are whisked away, and kids don't know when they come home if their parents are going to be there. Parents don't know if they're going to be able to pick up their kids anymore. We like this is this is where I, I tell people that you know first a lie is told, and then a lie is sold, right? So first it's told to you, and then it's sold, and then people can't imagine their lives without that lie. And so when you say abolish ICE, for example, it's this extreme radical call, abolish ICE? How could you say that? And it's like, you know, ICE is not that old. It's, it's you know, it, it, it's, it's less than 20 years old. And we were fine without it. <laughs> what has it done to make us safer? So who thought it was a good idea to put billions of dollars in the midst of all of the other things that we could be putting money into so that a militarized force could go down our streets and start uh, you know, knocking down the doors of immigrant families and throwing them into cells, as opposed to many of the criminals that are not immigrants uh, and that are actually uh, looting our resources from behind the scenes. Like who thought that this was a good idea? But the thing is, is that the, the imagination of people can no longer go beyond what has been sold as, an, as a necessity for your security and for your protection. And so that's why when you say less police, it's like, wait, what What do you mean? Then there's going to be too much crime. Well, how do we imagine a world where we invest in communities where crime becomes less uh, possible? Uh, and security for one group of people means security for all. And we don't speak about exceptionalism where, you know, American exceptionalism has harmed so much of the world for so long because the American people, you know, deserve to be safe. And that means the detriment of, of societies around the world. And now even at our border, you know, it's like, no, we don't believe in this. There, my being an American and being a patriot in that sense, and that I want good for my people, I want good for my country, does not mean that that is to the neglect of humanity. Just like my being a Muslim, you know, my love for Muslims around the world does not mean that I don't love humanity and that, that I believe in, in the success and prosperity only of my people in that sense. And so we have to abandon the thinking of exceptionalism and instead think about prosperity for everyone around us in the, in the broadest and most collective sense possible and also understand that systems of oppression uh, benefit a few and often take a lot of people on a ride and then harm a lot more people and uh, so when we can point to those systems of oppression and what comes out of them then we can do a better job of understanding the way forward for prosperity for uh, all of us in the most collective sense it's quite interesting that you are talking about prosperity um, because one question is also um, if our model around capitalism is also a reason why we have so much inequalities in our societies. Uh, we, we started this conversation uh, talking about uh, the guilt of the state uh, in this uh, social injustice that, that uh, we see. Uh, in the US, but in many other countries. But what about the markets? What about the capitalism that we still um, like, um, we still foster because we, it seems that it's the only model that we can use actually to, to have a, um, a prosperity in our society. What do you think about that? 
So any any human attempt is going to have pitfalls and failures, but I think that there are inherently predatory elements, unfortunately, within capitalism, and I think in the broader sense, individualism, um, that that just assign uh, value to a person only in regards to their output, <laughs> their financial value and their output, uh, either as a victim or as a contributor. Um, so, you know, that's where uh, military militarization becomes profitable to some, mass incarceration even becomes profitable to some. So even systems of oppression are financially rewarding and lucrative to some. Uh, so I think that um, we obviously need checks on individualism. We need checks on these systems and, and, and thinking about how to reimagine societies. Uh, we, should, we should be bold in challenging what people have put forth as unquestionable superior models. Hmm. And in the very context of um, the crisis that we are living, uh, the COVID-19 is striking um, the health system. Um, and we see that um, we have societies that are quite vulnerable because um, the social injustice was already here, but um, more and more people are already affected uh, today. Um, what are maybe the hints, um, the lessons that we can learn from this experience that we're living today to maybe have a new narrative about what should be our society, how should we protect the people, or should, should we give a change to anyone, um, and maybe what can be the changes in, again, our institutions, in our markets, uh, and more? Yeah, I mean, so I think that it is important for us to not just merely problematize, uh, but to also offer solutions. And um, you know, depending on the on the era, uh, on the area, and on the on the particular realm of discussion, uh, there are very specific things that can curb in the immediate, uh, you know, in the interim period, uh, things that are taking place. But then, in the process of that, when you demonstrate the effectiveness of things that um, that equalize, uh, then you start to have people imagine greater possibilities. And so, for example, in COVID-19, um, many people are experiencing vulnerability in, in food insecurity, for example, in ways that they never have before. And when more people experience vulnerability, it's a chance for that to be paralleled by a growth of empathy. And when people grow in empathy, then they can become more activated towards the other. However, to the previous point, um, because of the types of legislations that have come out, uh, you know, billionaires have have found a way to only get richer in the midst of this. So, uh, the wealth, the disproportionality of wealth, and the way that uh, certain people are are doubly affected uh, by the situation. Um, is only, is only perpetuating those gaps that we have in society that we need to solve. So here in the United States, it's, it's really tragic if you think about, for example, the protesters. Um, you know, minority communities have been, and particularly the black community here in, in Dallas, the Latino community, the Hispanic community, has been uh, disproportionately affected by COVID-19 for multiple reasons, right? The way, the, the, the uh, number of essential workers that are represented um, the uh, the lack of proper health care, all of these things, right? But then they have to protest a larger endemic, one that's also a silent disease that has been out there. And in the process of protesting that, putting themselves in further uh, risk, and unfortunately we're seeing a rise in protesters that have contracted COVID-19. So it's important for us to to use this moment of vulnerability to explore our empathy and to challenge uh, with, a, with, a, with a larger group of people um, these systems that continue to perp perpetuate these inequities. Hmm. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity to, to have insight, your insight about uh, the question of social justice in, in the context that is quite difficult and um, we, we have been talking about this vulnerability in the US, but uh, we can see that uh, also in so many countries. Um, I do hope that um, 
this discussion was valuable for the attendees of this uh, conference. And maybe we can have also some discussion, uh, some networking also on the platform Brella uh, after this talk. Thank you very much, Imam Omar Suleiman, for your participation. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.